to go. Um, all right, welcome to the NLP session. Uh, first up, we have Daphne Wong talking about the causal structure of semantic ambiguities. Okay, so first, can you hear me all right? Is that good? Cool. Okay, so uh, as the ten title would say, we're going to look at uh, causal relations uh, between meaning selection in different uh, ambiguous phrases. So first of all, we're starting with a very, very simple uh, statement, which is that most words are lexically ambiguous. So what this means is that uh, at least most words in English can be interpreted at least two different ways, uh, depending on the context. So here's some data from the British National Corpus. You can see that like a lot of words uh, actually are, uh, have a lot of uh, different possible ways that it can be interpreted. And it kind of even looks like, you know, the more common a word is, the more interpretations it actually can have. And uh, actually about 92% of all the words in the BNC have uh, are actually ambiguous, so that's very high number of words that are ambiguous. Okay, so now is that actually a problem for people to understand? Well, English, well, not really. So that's here's an example. So you have the word charge that has uh, about forty word net senses, so it's a very highly ambiguous word. But if you have a sentence like the battery needed a fresh charge. Well, it's pretty clear what the word charge means in here. Like, it doesn't take a long time for people to understand what actually is meant by the word charge. So uh, in order to see how this works, we have to move on to uh, psycholinguistics and see how people have uh, theorized how people deal with uh, ambiguity and stuff. So the first thing is that uh, there's many different things that have an influence on how people uh, disambiguate different words. So first thing is the grammatical types. So ambiguous nouns and ambiguous verbs are not uh, disambiguated in the same way. So here's the intuition. So if you have a ambiguous verb like to bore, um, if you see a partial sentence, like a not complete sentence, like the man bored, the reflex is not to straightforwardly associate a meaning to what to bore actually means, but more to ask kind of what is the argument of that verb? So what did the man bore? Was it was it, did he bore people? Or did he bore holes in the wall or something like this? Uh, for ambiguous nouns, it works a little bit differently. For example, if you have a non-complete sentence like the bank was, um, most people will already have a pretty good idea of what the word bank would mean. So whether it is financial institution or if it's the bank of a river. Uh, river. And uh, there is one difference, like that's the general idea of why it is different from verbs to nouns. So this is a very rough, uh, these are very rough numbers as well. That actually shows that uh, using eye tracking data. Uh, basically, it has been shown with multiple experiments that uh, people take about twice as long to um, disambiguate verbs, ambiguous verbs, rather than ambiguous nouns. And I, in particular, like the, uh, in order to disambiguate verbs, you need a much larger context than you do for nouns. Okay, so uh, that's not the end of the story. So there's also other things that influence how people deal with ambiguous words. And the other thing that has been shown to be very important is the level of ambiguity. So whether the different interpretation of the word of a word are related or unrelated. So if they are unrelated, like the word bank, for example, we talk about uh, homonymy, and let's see how people deal with that, basically. So for homonymous uh, nouns, what happens is that when you don't have any context, uh, as we briefly discussed in the intuition bit, is that you already have a predefined idea, uh, you already have a judgment of what is the most likely interpretation of bank, regardless of the context. And then as you get more information, then you're going to adjust the weights that you put on each of the interpretations in order to select the correct one. Uh, for polysemous nouns, so when you have a word that has multiple related interpretations, it works a little bit differently because when you have no context, you actually don't have a preference usually in uh, which interpretation you're going to want to select. And instead, you're going to select uh, sort of all of them at the same time with something that's called an underspecified meaning, essentially. And then obviously, as you have more context, 
you're going to add more and more information to which interpretation you actually want to select. So by the end of a sentence, usually you have a pretty good idea of what is actually the correct reading of a polysemous noun. So for verbs, it works once again very differently. So when you have a homonymous verb, like the verb to bore, uh, when you don't have any context, as we've discussed, uh, you're not going to have a predefined idea of what is actually the most likely or the less likely interpretation. But this first judgment is going to come when you have the arguments of this word. And then, uh, as before, if you have more context, obviously, you're going to try to be more and more likely uh, to select the correct reading of a verb. For polysemous verbs, uh, well, it wouldn't come as a surprise that if you have no context, you still have this underspecified meaning selection, where you basically take all the possible interpretations of the verb. But then even if you do have a little bit, if you do have the arguments of the verb, this doesn't tend to change that much. And uh, it's usually until pretty much the end of the sentence that you're going to try to actually select which is the correct interpretation of the verb given the sentence. Okay, so uh, what we've tried to do uh, in this kind of uh, project is to give a mathematical model of what actually does happen in the disambiguation process, essentially. So the way that we deal with this is that, for example, for in a subject verb phrase, we're going to have uh, two random variables, so one that corresponds to the subject and one that corresponds to the verb. So in this case, the values will correspond to which meanings or uh, which interpretations we want to select. And obviously, since they are ambiguous, they're not going to be deterministic. So there's going to be some probabilities associated with them. So on top of this, we also want to add uh, extra variables that basically is just choosing which subject and choosing which verb in a given phrase. So uh, that can be modeled as a random variable. It doesn't really have to be. It's basically just a choice that we as experimenters are going to make. And the very basic idea is that they can influence, uh, obviously, which uh, meaning of the subject is going to be selected and which meaning of the verb is going to be selected. Uh, on top of this, we also going to have uh, we're going to also add a hidden variable uh, that will be obviously unobserved. Uh, and the last thing is that we also possibly would have some influence from the subject to the verb or the verb to the subject, uh, if that makes sense. Uh, okay, so what we did uh, basically just linking back to previous work that we've done is to study it within a sort of quantum contextuality kind of way. So we, uh, what we could do is to start with st something that looks like a Bell scenario, for example, when you have the subject on one side, you have the verb on the other side. And then basically what you want to do is to check whether it is possible to put all of the differences that you observe um, within this hidden variable lambda. Uh, so that is, roughly speaking, the same thing as what we would do in a Bell experiment, essentially. So the problem with this is that even with this scenario, like that means that there is absolutely no influence that comes from the subject part to the verb part. And since we're dealing with very, very, very noisy data, this basically never happens. Uh, so we uh, instead also look at another framework that's dealing with contextuality in a more general sort of way where you allow some noise in your data. So that's the contextuality by default framework, where instead we are looking at uh, basically uh, Bayesian diagrams of this form. Uh, by the way, we did actually find some stuff that are contextual with this framework, but we're not going to talk about this in this talk. Um, OK, so what we actually did in uh, this work is to look at definite causality. So uh, basically, whether we can have, we relax the fact that over here, we don't have any influence from the meaning that is selected, uh, the meaning of the subject to the meaning of the verb. So we relax this, and we want to check whether it is compatible with something that goes from subject to verb or verb to subject. So there's also one problem with that, uh, which is the same one that we had for contextuality, is that we're dealing with noisy data. So it's never going to be 100% compatible with either of these, basically. So instead, what we did is to calculate the so-called causal fraction. 
uh, that has been introduced in uh, this paper in QPR last year, uh, where we can basically quantify how much of our probability distributions are going to be compatible with either this causal order or this one. Uh, if we were to go further, so we stopped actually at the definite, definite causality, but if we were to go further, we could also ask whether this is contextual or not, but that's just basically left us future work. Okay, so now let's uh, see actually what kind of data we've actually, uh, how we collected our data. So the experiment we did was to put basically a bunch of surveys on uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk. And this is basically the task that people have seen, uh, that people saw. So you have a uh, phrase, for example, the picture throws, where both words were ambiguous. So for example, picture can be jug or picture can be a baseball player and throw can be literal meaning of throwing or a figurative meaning of throwing. And uh, then we showed them one meaning combination. So for example, picture is a jug and throwing is throwing literally. And what uh, the workers had to do is to rate the plausibility of this meaning combination given the phrase that was uh, prompted before. Uh, so this, uh, these plausibility ratings came from uh, completely impossible to extremely likely. So uh, if we uh, have all the possible meaning combinations, then we, this gives rise to a probability distribution. So here we have what is the subject of the phrase, what's the verb. These correspond to essentially, uh, it's just indexes for the meaning combination, so the meaning of the subject and the meaning of the, uh, the verb. And then we basically transform the plausibility ratings into probabilities. And uh, here's for, uh, one example of a probability distribution. And then what we do is that we uh, combine multiple uh, probability distributions uh, corresponding to different phrases into uh, empirical models of this form, which we can use uh, to study the causality of, uh, of basically this, these types of phrase, phrases. Okay, so here are the first results that we have. So this is basically the causal fractions for subject verb phrases. Uh, both for the subject to verb uh, causal order and verb to subject uh, causal order. So what we can see is that the predominant uh, causal order that was compatible was the subject to verb, uh, where all basically all the models that we had had a causal fraction that was greater than 70%. And in fact, uh, if we did have some error bars, uh, it would actually kind of creep up to 95, 96%. Um, uh, the other causal fraction was actually quite high as well, but it was a lot lower than the one for uh, subject to verb. And we did the same for verb object phrases as well. So once again, we can see that the, uh, the most dominant uh, causal order that was compatible with our data was the object to verb this time uh, causal order. So what can we say from this? Well, we have a subject to verb and object to verb, therefore the most likely conclusion is that actually verbs are disambiguated later than the arguments, which is great, because this is also what, hap what, what people in psycholinguistics have seen in uh, eye tracking experiments. So now we wanted to go one step further and see if we can also replicate other results. So for example, related to the levels of ambiguity of each of the words. So looking at uh, verb object models, if we look at uh, the level of ambiguity of the verbs, so for example, here zero means that two verbs were polysemous, two means that the two verbs were homonymous. So what we can actually see is that uh, when both of the verbs were polysemous, the causal fraction from object to verb was higher, which it sort of makes sense uh, in the context of psycholinguistics as well, of the findings of synchro linguistics, because polysemous verbs need a lot larger context to be disambiguated. So it wouldn't make sense if the verb, when it's polysemous, uh, is dis disambiguated definitely after its object, if that makes sense. So when you look at the levels of ambiguity of the nouns, we also find something that's pretty nice as well, uh, which is that when both the nouns were homonymous, then once again, the causal fraction from object to verb kind of went up. 
uh, which also is consistent with psycholinguistics because uh, homonymous noun needs a lot less context to be disambiguated and therefore uh, the object will be disambiguated a lot earlier than the verb would be. And then uh, we would expect pretty much the same thing for subject verb models, but it didn't quite work the same way. So when you looked at the levels of ambiguity of the verbs, we obtained similar results as before. So if the verb is uh, polysemous, then causal fraction from subject to verb is higher. But if you looked at the level of ambiguity of the nouns, uh, it worked, uh, it, we didn't basically see any relation whatsoever. Uh, which is a little bit harder to explain, but still not completely inconsistent with the literature on how do actually people uh, disambiguate words. So yes, sure, uh, homonymous nouns need a lot less context to be disambiguated. But at the same time, if the disambiguation context is found after, has been shown that people do hesitate a lot on in choosing what is actually the correct uh, meaning of the word. So that would explain why it does kind of balance out the two effects, but that's a bit more speculative than the rest of the results. Okay, so let's move on to a very brief conclusion. So we've shown that uh, using the causal fraction that has been developed for quantum mechanics, we can actually replicate some of the results from psycholinguistics, notably that verbs are disambiguated after their arguments. Uh, and that uh, polysemous verbs uh, need a much larger context and therefore a lot, take a lot longer to do, get disambiguated than homonymous ones. And then finally, that in verb object models, uh, homonymous nouns are definitely um, disambiguated or polysemous ones. Okay, now moving on to future works. Uh, so we would like to be able to do something with this result essentially. Uh, so, for example, uh, to adapt it to a computational uh, protocol or algorithm or something. So, uh, if we did have 100% uh, causal order subject to verb, for example, well, we would expect something, a process, any kind of process that would look like this. Uh, the problem is, is that we're actually not having 100% of this causal order. So, we have uh, some proportion of it that is compatible with this and some and the rest of it can be like any kind of process really so what we would expect is something just the extension of what we had the problem is is that there's so many variables uh that take in, that we could take into account that actually we basically are a little bit stuck with that so we don't have, <laughs> we can't actually find uh well it's very hard to find a process that is actually that would actually describe our data uh, something else that would be quite interesting is to look at full sentences. So instead of just having subject verb or verb object, we could have subject verb object sentences. So the good news for that is that we don't actually have to start from scratch again, uh, because we can use these two results that we have, which hopefully are true. Uh, and all we have to check basically is to whether subject and object are disambiguated independently, or if there's some inferences going from the subject to the object or from the object to the subject. And then uh, finally, what we would like to do as well is to apply this framework to other types of ambiguity that arise in natural language. So I put syntactic ambiguity here, but we also would like to do that for co-reference ambiguity, for example. So that would be quite interesting to see if we can get some results in that as well. That's the end. And that's also the link to the archive paper, if you want to have a look at it. Questions? Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. So I, th I think in, in relation with the difficulty of finding like anything like a, a diagram that represents yeah. your data, it's probably because here you go beyond max principle. It's not anymore that something tells us something else or something, yeah. or, or you got common cause. So you're generally going beyond max principle, which I think is a good thing, by the way. Because I've been telling this to people, well, we need to go beyond max principle. And so probably this, this would be applicable beyond ambiguity to just causal flow in language. Yes, Causal absolutely. flow in language, yeah. which is beyond Mach, right? Yeah, yeah definitely. Okay. Other questions? Um, yeah. Okay.
Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, so this is not really a quantum question, but do you know if similar ambiguity arise if, if uh, machines actually try to interpret uh, words? Uh, so that's actually something that we've been thinking of doing as well. So using, for example, neural networks uh, and neural embeddings to see if we actually find the same kind of things. So that's the project that we have ongoing that we haven't found anything yet, basically. Great. I'm looking forward. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you for your talk. Um, could you maybe say something about um, the uh, choice to go for uh, Amazon uh, Mechanical Turk and the, uh, the people that answered all yes. your questions? Uh, what kind of like uh, sample was that? Uh, so I have to say it was a little bit random. So we uh, did ask for people to have good ratings already. So they, they were classified as masters. But apart from that, we didn't put any other um, restrictions on who could do the task. Um. Uh, so we had about, I think, 2,500 people that answered tasks. Okay, um, so I was I was curious. Um, so throughout the talk, you used a kind of temporal language when you yes. were talking about this. You were saying yes. that this that the verb was disambiguated after mm -hmm. the subject. Um, can you also give a kind of a causal interpretation to to this ordering? So, so is in in what sense is disambiguating the subject causing the verb to, to disambiguate? So the idea is that uh, if you do have a temporal order, well, if you can't basically causally, you can't go the other way. Uh, so that's one thing to, to start with. And then uh, if you do have the idea, basically, is that if you have some information about, uh, for example, if the subject is disambiguated first, if you have some information about that, then you kind of pretty sure that's true, then you can have some influence on how the verb is disambiguated just because that information can influence what's going on with the verb if that makes sense uh that's how we would interpret the causal relations uh from basically the temporal order it's just that you basically physically have more information therefore it can uh, influence okay, so, the rest of it so sort of in a um a, a a negative sense or something like this and that you're saying, yeah. saying something like there is no causal influence from the verb to, yes. to the subject yeah. something like that rather than not thinking about counterfactuals or something like this like what if if yeah. I, I got a different subject would that have changed my it, yeah yeah so that is uh well that is kind of what we're trying to do basically so if you change the subject how much is it going to change hmm. okay. uh, what the verb is going to be um and yes, yeah, similarly, if you change the verb, is the subject actually going to change? Well, obviously, they're going to change a little bit. But the, the, good th uh, the, the thing that was actually quite surprising is that actually it doesn't change that much if you change what the verb is. So that is something that came out of this. That makes sense? <laughs> so all of these have a background reading time, right? Yes, yes. Right, so if you change the language to somewhere, something that has a different... Yeah or the conventions for subject, verb, object, mm -hmm. order, stuff like that. Um, what happens there? Something so, similar? But... Yeah, so actually we haven't checked, but I would expect that something similar does happen because for example, when you have um, verb objects uh, phrases, the object is disambiguated before the verb, even if the object is after. And uh, I think in, uh, when people have the, this eye tracking thing as well, People did go back to the verb, so they read it uh, in one way, and then at some point they have to come back to what the, uh, to to the verb to see what's going on. So even if there is an order, then I would expect pretty much the same results. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, I I think we should uh, move on. Uh, let's thank the speaker again. <laughs> I'm I'm in charge here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So there was colleagues at in 2008 at Oxford University, 
Uh, one is in the room, one knew about like the, the grammar of, of uh, grammar mathematics, you could call it. Uh, Steve was also there in Oxford. Steve is now the head of AI at Continuum. And, and he knew about vector representations of meaning, which is now like everywhere around us. Uh, at the time, it was kind of more of an academic thing. And then the natural question came about how to combine these two, how to combine grammar and meaning. And this is now a, a bit of an old story. I think most people in the room know about that um, we came up with what now is referred to as the DiscoCat model of language. And uh, a lot of the stuff, uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people here in the room have heard about this before. Uh, so this basically what you do is you, you, you take inspiration from categorical quantum mechanics, so everything you can find in our Dodo book, so like everybody's here. <laughs> everything you can find in our Dodo book, basically you apply and you apply it to language, where you think of states as meanings of words. So these are states, Alice hates Bob, you think of them as meanings of words, so they're basically just vectors. And then you think of what in quantum would be some sort of cup states, bell states, and all that you think of as a representation of grammatical structure. And then, so just, just to indicate this, these are the meanings of words. This is the grammatical structure. And together, when you just compute this, because it's all just linear algebra now, when you compute this, this is a representation of the meaning of the sentence. And this is how you combine meaning and grammar. And then you can do things like you make inner products between different sentences and you see how they do. And a, a lot of experiments were done by people like Merenush and, and Dimitri Kartsaklis. And uh, this stuff worked very well. So it was generally a new thing. I mean, it was theoretically a new thing. Uh, there were some shortcomings, and therefore we came up with another kind of model of language. It was in some sense, it was an elaboration, but also a departure. And so we start. you start with this picture. And one thing you can't do with it is compose it. Because if you want to compose it with another sentence, all you can do is compute an inner product. And so your meanings are gone, You're, you end up with a number. So how can we turn this into something that you can actually compose? Uh, basically, we sort, of, we sort of assumed some internal structure here, introducing spiders, we introduced some internal structure in the verb. Then we just pull them out. And now you can actually compose the thing. Look, boom. Now I'm composing two sentences. Alice hates Bob and Bob likes beer. And you can go on. You can go on like that. And this actually works generally. You can show that this works generally. And so this was something we in, in, introduced in the mathematics of text structure uh, not too long ago. Uh, so, and, and there's a, a lot of other features, like for example, your meanings aren't static anymore. Whenever, whenever here you apply the verb hates to Alice and Bob, you're actually entangling Alice and Bob. While in standard uh, vector meanings, things would always be represented as it is entangled. Well, obviously, if Alice hates Bob, then there is a connection between that connects them. So you want something entangled. So that's, that's so meanings get updated. Anyway, so that's another model which will also come up in my talk here. Uh, so what is kind of nice is, so this is like a representation of something. I don't know whether you re uh, recognize this, but so this is supposed to be like a linguistic circuit, but you can equally well think of that as some sort of movie script. This is just events which take place in a movie here once upon a time in the West. And here I describe them by images. And here I describe them just as a linguistic representation of text. So these things become much closer to each other, sort of the visual and the, and the language. Uh, OK, yeah. So I mean, uh, they, I'm not going to say too much about it. But in standard language, words are written on a line, always, because we can only speak on a line. But of course, we can think in parallel too, like for example, that's a representation of music you write. And when you're playing music, you're doing things in parallel. Our brain can perfectly represent this. So why should language meaning live on a line? It shouldn't. Anyway, that's a short component. Okay, now space time has meaning. So space time plays a very important role in language. You've got things like prepositions, in, next to, after, on, with. Uh, many other word meanings like chasing have clear spatial connections, uh, pointing. We do this a lot. We live in space. Like an important thing old AI learned was like embodiment is really important. The fact where you actually act as an AI. It's a bit gone now with machine learning. Uh, and, and you can even think of uh, space time as the origin of language. Like, like people want to take down a mammoth, so you have to communicate. So basically all your 
communication is going to be about spatial references. So maybe the structure of space is itself a representation, uh, the structure of language, which is actually a representation of space intrinsically. Anyway, that's a speculation. Uh, so the paper I'm going to talk about here is with Vincent Wang. It's a talking space influence from special linguistic meaning. So we want to do spatial reasoning. So, he, so the way you would reason in language about space, we want to actually see that this automatically becomes a computation in space that gives you the right answer. That's the goal here. So the sort of, there's different kinds of spaces. I mean, this is a horrible representation of Euclidean space. This is a subway, you got a chessboard, you got crazy spaces like Pendrel staircase. And so we want to account for all those different spaces. I mean, we made it ourselves very easy. So basically, as a model, we took a monoidal subcategory of the category of relation, sets and relations, and then the set would just be the space. So, so you just, and if you got many, this is an important thing. For each agent, you need a copy of the space. Each agent has his own copy of the space, where they are. I mean, years ago, we tried with a bunch of people, and we were, we were so stupid that we actually tried to put everybody in the same space. And it doesn't work. You get an additive structure and you need a multiplicative structure. Anyway, so then you got spatial relations. It's mean I'm next to you and all that. They are just mathematical relations, ultimately. And then you got uh, just your standard compositions, uh, sequential and in parallel. And here are some exam examples of spatial relations, like move right is represented graphically here. King's moves, that's another spatial relation. Uh, uh, next stop and blah blah blah. You, you see, you see, you see the system how it works. So you can re really represent these relations uh, higher than this is in the Cartesian case, whatever. Uh, and then, of course, you get your cups and your caps in the in, in the in the category of relations. So you can represent grammar too. So here is a representation of this grammatical structure as a relation. Uh, okay. So what I want to show now is that. This linguistic, so you've got this chessboard, you've got this linguistic description, description the pawn next to a king that a knight, knight can capture. That would be a linguistic representation. So if we actually put the meanings in of the words, to actually get there. So that's basically the game. So, so is this really a model that actually allows you to basically get to that point in the space? I mean, you would expect so, but let's see. Uh, so the pawn next to the king, that's sort of a part. Um, so we got here the pawn next to the king. Let's see what the pawn next to the king means. That's, it's really about computing meaning. So we use the usual spy. I'm just, see, this is just a diagram deform deformation. Eh? I'm just pulling down the spider. So next to the king, next to the king is just a king and then next to. Uh, uh, so we get this, king next to, because what we've got here is we got next to a king and then a pawn, and this is actually just a conjunction. The category of relations, this is just conjunction, and conjunction is intersection. This is just intersection. So let's, so this is uh, next to king, we got next to king here, and we got pawn here, we intersect, okay, we're not there yet. We got a few possibilities. We got this, 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 we're not there yet. And that's, that's good, because if you were there, that, then, then something would have gone wrong. So now we have to say that a knight can capture, and that a knight can capture. It's actually much more interesting, this one. So, so, okay, this is also a test of, for example, of these representations, like how do you represent a relative pronoun? That was a thing which we came up with years ago in a, a paper, so just by randomly guessing. And now you can actually show that this works. That this was actually the right representation of the word that because it will all work out. So that and I can capture. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm just doing again spider yanking and all that. So we end up with something like that. Now this is a tricky one. A knight can capture. Now can capture is not a static thing because it actually define, it depends on the, knife, the fact that you got an eye there. So it's not just about where you are in space, but how you can behave in space. And each chess piece has different behaviors. They have different rules. So there is something too restrictive with our model of space because it just represents positions. It doesn't represent capabilities. So we have to go to a more complex notion of space, well, not more complex. So you got, for example, the chessboard with your chess positions, and then we, we extend the space with possible behaviors. So, so each agent now has this physical space combined with its own behaviors. So the model of space is now consists of two parts, where you are, and what you can do. And then, 
So there is a way then to model can capture in a very elegant way, just using wires. So this is can capture. This is the, the, the meaning of can capture for us now. And it works because, so here, so this is the, so basically these two wires represent the agent space, like the capabilities. So you stick in X's moves here, and then you get this. So you effectively get X's moves out. And then basically, uh, if you all compute it, this is another conjunction here, this is another conjunction between this part and that part. You intersect these two, and then you can get it. So it, it works out nicely. It works out nicely, so that's cool. Uh, now, why was I talking about the circuits? This is all nice, and all nice, but it's quite complicated. This is, a, this is how we deal with language, grammatical. This is the grammatical structure people have come up with, with language. Let's now look how the same thing looks in a circuit. The, the pawn next to a king that the knight can capture. Uh, wait, is, yeah, yeah. Much simpler, right? It's much simpler. So actually, the, the meaning of language is just much better represented here. And you, you can see, again, you can go on and you want to go on, possibly, if you go, are ambiguous. Here is another nice example. The ostrich next to a tree that a cheetah next to grass can capture. So here, the, the abilities is, not, is, is about many things. It's about how fast are you, are, what is your endurance. So in principle, you can encode all of that stuff, too, in the space. And then again, you could work this out, and you'll get there. This, this would be a much more continuous calculation, of course, because here you work with real value, values and stuff like that. But that's not a problem. Again, the circuit is much easier. Uh, the cheetah next to the grass, grass, uh, the ostrich next to a tree, and then one can capture the other. You see, it becomes harder to say this. And the reason is because our language wants to be online, and this thing is not online. And so, so, so you, you, there's actually, it's actually becoming ambiguous how I can say this. I could say the cheetah next to the grass can capture the ostrich next to the tree, or uh, whatever. <laughs> You see, you see, it can go, I think I have to run out. So what you can do is you can also combi combine space with other senses. For example, this is, this is taste, and there you got color. And then you can actually write down the cheese inside the suitcase stinks. So now you got the space split up in something which is about position, something which is about smell. And then there will be some interaction, of course, between these things. Well, in this, that's the cheese. The cheese is actually what connects the two pets. It's again much easier to see as a circuit. Uh, the cheese inside the suitcase stinks. Uh, I think that's all I've got to say. Yeah, that's it. Questions? Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. I was wondering about how you deal with ambiguities in space in, in a model like this. So here it's been, you've had a chessboard where all of the uh, positions are very well defined and so on. So is, is there any notion of this? I mean, I mean you, you do probability distributions over space huh? in the same way like the, we, we have ambiguity. We used to use density matrices over vectors. Same, same thing. But of course, yeah, this is just simplified, okay. of course. Right. Thank you. Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, I had a very similar question, but um, regarding the uh, ambiguous with, ambiguity within the sentence itself, because the original pawn knight um, uh, king um sentence i read it slightly differently in that the king was the one being captured rather than the pawn or like like oh uh is the that is in, ambiguous so is uh, the pawn next to a king that a knight can capture is the king the one that's being captured or is it the pawn the one that's being captured and here you're you are in the end coming up with something that you determined one or the other but essentially it is it's an ambiguous sentence it, it is to some extent it is to some extent, but not when once you give the grammar, it's not ambiguous anymore, because the grammar would look different. Yeah. Oh yes. Yeah. Exactly. So with the, with, you're very right. With the diagram of the grammar, it's not ambiguous anymore. You, you can immediately see that that that, that because of the wiring structure. Yeah. But you 
that, that is, of course, ambiguous things like a, uh, my, my favorite example is a black metal fan. So yeah. this, can be, <laughs> <laughs> this can be two completely different things, but the grammar is different. So that's a different kind of ambiguity than Daphne was talking about. Not so exactly. you've got like linguistic ambiguity where you don't know what your words are. And yes. then you've got grammatical ambiguity. And sometimes you've got do both. That one choice of meaning corresponds with another yes. choice of grammar. I mean, ambiguity sucks, but that's why and, and so, so, <laughs> so, so then the, you, you need to use like CP maps to represent your different possible parsings. By the way, all parsings in the world are probabilistic. They pick out the most likely parsing. That's, what, that, that's part of the problem. Uh, just wondering, is this next to a relation? Is it symmetric? It, this is one you would, I mean, kind of, um, although I think next, th this is very subjective in the sense if, if you got a very big object and a very small object, then typically you would interpret it in the way that the small one is next to the big one. You wouldn't really say the house is next to Alex. So there is, there is a, so in some way, in some mathematical way, it's symmetric, but in use, it's not really symmetric. There is a, there is clearly a, a preference to 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 the, the, the to the to the object. The optics is sort of the static reference, and the subject is somebody you position relative to the object. So mathematically, we think yeah. In use, no. I think. Well, in chess, it's symmetric. I mean, in, in chess, yeah. it's pretty symmetric, I would say. Uh, all, all you, may, maybe you would actually preference you you may you would take your own pieces as the reference, maybe. Also, it's about like reference frames. There's a story about the reference frame here. What do you take as the reference? Then um, why are you killing two legs of that? Because which legs? Uh, there's like two Frobenius annihilations on that. Ah, ah, because the sentence type is two wires. Oh. Sentence type is two wires. Uh, well, I mean, in this Cosurk, you replace your sentence type, and we do this here already a little bit, you replace your sentence type with noun types. And this can vary depending on, this can vary depending on the sentence. Typically, the number of nouns you got in a, in a sentence de determines how many wires your sentence type is. So it can be one, can be two, can be three, can be many. Um, so it, it looks like... Um... Both what you're doing here in the semantics and what you're trying to accomplish, uh, it looks like a conjunctive query where I've, where these relation these relations are, you could think of them as just some tables in a database and I'm querying those tables to get you. Yeah, in this particular case, yeah, with the, with the, probably with the animals running around in the wild, it's, it's, it's a much more discrete space. You're, you're, yeah. I don't, I don't know, I can't think. I mean, there is a very naive model of space, like you just using a set. There's, of course, much more structure in space than a set, and this, so it would become more... If you want to put this in practice in an AI, you'll have to bring in a lot more structure. And then, then, then this CS perspective would vanish, I think. just wanted to mention, do you, do you know about this Bonke and Sobachinsky paper where they show that rel is sort of sound and complete for conjunctive queries. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there is a paper by Alexis and Giovanni and Constantinos that kind of, the, is Constantinos still here? No, you can't. That, that sort of directly relates this to disco cat type stuff. Any other questions? Okay. Interesting. Oh, you go. Couldn't, couldn't you make uh, next to symmetric by just having a spider on the object Y and then discarding it, essentially? And then that's... Yeah, that, that, that's, that's what you would typically do, I guess. And then, and then this could relate back to the ambiguity in that, because you could easily not discard the object Y and then... And then I mean, you, you have to be that. careful. So the symmetry is not just about how this box looks. The symmetry is about what's inside here. So this, this can be perfectly symmetric with two spiders, but what if what's inside there is not... There, there, there are symmetric words with, like married to or something. That's what you expect to be pretty symmetric. Although may, maybe not in, in, 
well, at least in monogamous countries, I don't know how this would be in polygamous country, in one direction of polygamous countries or something like that. I don't know. I, I would imagine in man, I would imagine in some some culture next to is like really very very uh, marriage is very symmetric. It's a uh, it's the say in 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 bad places it's the woman who's married to the man and not the other way around. If you see what I mean. Um, would a like direct linearization of this graphical syntax could that be represented by something like quantum Montague grammar? By what? A, a Montague grammar. Montag. So 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 this this is simplification of Montag. Well, well, it's both simplification and an extension of Montag to type grammars. So Mont the way to think about Montag, and that, by the way, the paper about from Alexis Giovanni and. Um, and constant of the interpretation of Montague grammar specifically using this relational model. So, so what, all what I did here was basically within the category of relations. So you're very close to Montague grammar. So the, 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 the syntax is both simpler and more complex than Montague grammar in the sense that Montague doesn't have these dot structures. The semantics here is pretty much exactly the same as Montague grammar, it's true valued. But you could, but if you want to stick, do this in practice and you want to learn your spatial relations, which is what you want to do, then you would replace your sets and relations with a vector space. Otherwise you can't learn. And these things would be much less discrete, just like in the case of uh, Daphne's model of causality. Thank you. Yeah. All right, let's uh, thank the speakers again. Thanks.